We are all set. Good evening and welcome to this month's Speak to Council session. As a reminder, all speakers have two minutes for the comments. If speakers are participating via Zoom, we ask that they address council with the same respect they would expect and to avoid the use of profanities. Uh, a staff member will notify speakers when they have 30 seconds left and speakers will be removed from the Zoom call once their time has expired. Staff members will read the first two minutes of all written comments submitted. I'd like to remind our participants and those watching online that my colleagues and I are here to listen to the comments presented before us tonight. And as such, it is standard that we do not respond during this session. Participants' contact information has been shared with council and I encourage my colleagues to follow up with any comments or concerns that piques their interest. If you are interested in participating on Zoom and you're watching, live, watching a live stream on Zoom, while you're wa waiting to join the meeting, please remember to mute that live stream before entering the Zoom meeting or you will hear a confusing echo of yourself. We will now begin our speak to council session. Robert McFarland will be joining us by Zoom. He is not in the waiting room at this time. Dwayne Wilder by Zoom. Dwayne, you're up. Uh, you're on mute. Hey. Um, so my name is Dwayne Wilder. Um, thank you for a few moments of your attention. I am here as an, an engaged citizen and also as a member of Extinction Rebellion, a group of mostly young people enraged at how our leaders continue decade after precious decade to ignore treating climate crisis as a crisis. In short, I come to urge you to look carefully at the aspirational nature of Rochester Climate Action Plan drafted, drafted four years ago. I'll leave an overview of its problems to others and to your own discernment and concentrate on one aspect of what is not there what the city of Rochester itself might do. So would you please form and quickly initiate an end to needless use of single use plastics. I have seen individual beets shrink wrapped in grocery stores, I've seen cheese that is well preserved in paper and then sold shrink wrapped in that same pl plastic. All these plastics could be reduced or eliminated completely. Further, grocery stores now use plant-based plastic bags for its fresh vegetables, yet continue to use petroleum-based non-degradable shrink wrap plastic when another choice could be made. You have the power to attend that practice, to amend 30 it, seconds and work with the county to make Rochester and Monroe County a region in which single use plastics do not make it into the gullets of birds, lake and ocean life, and ultimately our own and our children's tissues and microplastic form. Thank you for your attention. Hannah Scabaro by Zoom. Hannah. Hannah, are you there? Is Britton Evans on? By Zoom? Britton's not in the waiting room. Zoe Markle? I think I was before Britton in the email. I, I can speak, um, and then, hang on. Um, 
Hi, my name is Zoe Markle, and I am speaking on behalf of Extinction Rebellion America Rochester chapter. I'm a resident of downtown Rochester. Climate science has made it clear that we will experience a level of global warming proportional to the total of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases released into the atmosphere. Therefore, st stabilizing climate requires carbon emissions to reach net zero. The longer we take to do this, the more the climate will change. This year, the International Energy Agency said that they still feel it is possible for us to reach net zero emissions by 2050, but the large-scale actions need to start now. This includes no new oil and gas fields or unabated coal plants approved for development. This September, the city of Rochester took a step in the right direction by joining a community choice aggregation and providing the opportunity to transfer to 100% renewable energy in residential homes and small businesses. However, in order to make this action as effective as possible, the city should be clear about how many citizens choose to take part in the program and work towards getting those who are unsure about the switch to renewable energy on board. Rochester also needs to be sure that low-income groups are not left behind in the switch to renewable energies. In July of 2021, 63,123 people in Monroe County received assistance from the Home Energy Assistance Program, which means at least 30% of the population is unable to participate in the CCA program. As more cities implement CCAs, the city of Rochester can lead by example in an inclusive and comprehensive renewable energy program. As an idea to help families, the city could invest in building more solar, like the two megawatt plant they already own, and use it to produce energy in a carbon-free way. The city council should also support the Excelsior Energy Project's 280 megawatt solar farm, as that alone would be capable of powering two-thirds of the households in Monroe County. You have already done this once, and we know you are capable of doing it again for a good cause. I would also like to voice my support for Simran's family and ask the city council to release the body cam and blue light footage to them. Thank you. It's time, Zoe. Anna? Good evening, council members. I'm Hannah Scarborough, resident of downtown Rochester, speaking on behalf of Extinction Rebellion America Rochester. We are lucky here in this city, having not yet experienced as devastating and destructive effects of the climate crisis as other parts of the globe, but we are still seeing its effects and we must not turn our heads. The time for action in order to prepare for the climate emergencies more dire effects is now. Rochester is experiencing a dramatic increase in precipitation and flooding, which will only increase rapidly with time. In numerous reports and climate action plans, some dating all the way back to 2011, the city of Rochester has recognized the danger of these weather shifts. Climate plans from 2016 state the measures the city of Rochester is willing to take in order to better prepare for the emergency we are facing, but the city has taken negligible action. Paying lip service to the fact that this is a crisis New York City's severe flooding last month, killing at least 45 people, is a prime example of how close and how devastating the climate emergency is. We must use the nature of our environment, living in a place that hasn't yet been deeply impacted by the climate emergency, as an opportunity to prepare our communities and to grow our community, be of aid to those who are fleeing even more catastrophic disasters. These actions should include investing in our low-income communities, where all citizens, not just those of means, are prepared to survive through extreme weather conditions, flooding, and displacement. Our actions must be specific and direct and immediate. As a few examples, providing programs for climate relief in the case that families are displaced due to flooding, investing in the infrastructure of all neighborhoods in Rochester, beginning work on reconstructing a higher flood wall on the border of the Genesee River, which has since been torn down. A Reuters 2021 report showed that the cost of flood damage to U.S. homes will increase by 61% within 30 years. Let me make myself clear, these actions are cheaper than waiting to act. These actions are the logical alternatives to ignoring this crisis. It is not fiscally sustainable to wait. We are calling on you, council members, to act now. I'd like to add that I urge the council to say no to increased militarization of the Rochester Police Department, and I want to- Linda Edwards, by Zoom. 
Yeah, uh, good evening, council members. Uh, I'm Linda Edwards, and I'm here on behalf of Extinction Rebellion Rochester to protest climate change. Uh, 2021 has been dubbed a frightening wake-up call if we don't make immediate reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, meeting the goals set by the Paris Accord are beyond reach. It will soon be too late, now is the time for action. Despite dire warnings, many climate policies from the local to the global founder on a critical lack of political will. According to a Brookings Institute assessment of the nation's climate action plans, roughly two thirds of American cities are not meeting their targeted city emission levels. Given the absence of reporting from city council on the progress of its greenhouse gas emission reduction goals, we cannot know if this is the case in Rochester, but there is every reason to assume that Rochester has been doing little better at facing the crisis. More than four years ago, Rochester's Climate Action Plan was called an inspirational document. Since then, there have been additional key local indicators to warn us of impending disaster. Climate change is already impacting the city and will only increase in severity over time. Moreover, the effects of these impacts will not be equitable because some of our residents for economic or other reasons are more able to respond to the crisis than others. Climate activists have chastised our leaders for delivering too much talk in their pledges at the same time as scientists have declared a code red for humanity. Greta Thunberg recently has said they pretend they are listening to us, but they are not. Just look at the numbers. Seconds, the science doesn't lie. We must do more. We must act with greater emergency to provide a path to a livable future for our children, youth and climate refugees. Platitudes and talking points will not fix the problem. We need greater transparency and accountability in our city's climate goals. We need confirmation that council has been taking the action that it said it would take and is yielding results. We need a commitment to a revised CAP that goes beyond aspiration towards advancing a truly equitable, low carbon and climate resilient city. Thank you. Dorsey James by Zoom. Dorsey? Dorsey, are you there? Jack Motley? Jack? Jack, you can go ahead while Dorsey is connecting. You're on mute. Yeah. My name is Jack Motley, a longtime resident of the city of Rochester. I'm speaking today as an individual on a matter of great concern, which has surfaced on introductory 371, the New York State Homeland Security Grant for Terrorism Prevention, which will give the Rochester Police Department $252,000 to purchase automated license plate readers. How automated oh. license plate readers will prevent terrorism is unfathomable to me. Hello? Hello? Excuse me, hang on a second. Yes. Dorsey, yes. please. Thank you. you want me to okay. Go ahead and finish, Jack. As in most of New York State, there are no provisions or policies for how the RPD manage the data they collect, not how long they keep it, nor who they share the data with, nor who is authorized to see or use it. In short, it is totally unregulated and unpoliced. Even the radical organization known as the International Association of Chiefs of Police has recognized the danger, warning in 2009 that, quote, mobile LPR units could read and collect the license plate numbers of vehicles parked at addiction counseling centers, doctor's offices, health clinics, or even staging areas for political protests, unquote, and therefore can have a, quote, 
chilling effect on social and political activities, unquote. The New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services in 2013 already showed Monroe County is having one of the highest number of plate readers in the state, and that was just from DCJS funding, not from other sources. I know every politician, ironically, lives in terror of being called soft on terrorism, but this is going too far. Giving the Rochester Police Department yet more tools for the persecution and harassment of peaceful, law-abiding people, especially those who engage in their right to peaceably assemble and to petition for the redress of grievances would be unconscionable. We have no reason to trust the Rochester Police Department when they say they will use these additional toys responsibly. Vote no and do not allow the RPD to receive this funding until adequate safeguards are in place on how the existing data can be used and who has access to it. Our lawmakers in Albany, Albany do not have the spine to control this. I hope the members of the City Council of Rochester do. Thank you. Dorsey? Yes. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Dorsey James, and I'm calling reference to the uh, code readers myself license plate readers, um, it's too much power. Um, it's an intrusion on our Fourth Amendment rights. This, this device, um, from what they're saying, they can, an uh, officer can just look at you or you look at him wrong and he can run your information and form probable cause to pull you over. And no doubt these devices are gonna be placed in the inner city the, among the poorest of the citizens here. It's just another tool to um, harass them, given the fact that the FBI has warned us that white supremacists and neo-Nazis have infiltrated the police departments throughout the country. We see it play out every day. The policies that the police departments are enacting are just blatant Fourth Amendment violations. We see it every day. People are getting murdered for just asking why they're being stopped on traffic stops. The Fourth Amendment requires them to tell you uh, what they stop you for in this cold reader they just you don't know who has is black people are at a impasse because when we see an officer come i'm a black man when i see a, a white officer i don't know who he is he could be he's wearing a uniform but he has violent intent these are non-violent fractures the money can be you best spent with code enforcement have code enforcement go to people home after they receive the letters and Talk to the people and say, hey, listen, we got to take your place. You can't drive the car because God knows you want to go to work one morning. The police pull you over, just take you out of the car, tow your car, you one paycheck from the poor house anyway, and you got to get your vehicle out of the tow for, for, for an uninsured vehicle, some money. It's just we can do better with the money, with the tension that's going on right now. It's this is just further um, intrusion. You just should think about the things that we let the police do nowadays. That's fine, for, for just to come up on my vehicle and tell me to give me my license and registration and don't tell me why first is a blatant violation. Diane Stango, by Zoom. You're on mute. Okay, how about that? Yes. Okay, uh, council members, uh, the appalling delay in release of body cam and blue light footage and forbidding the family to view Simran Gordon's body is further proof that RPD and Locust Club cannot be trusted and do not act in the best interest of public safety. The body cam footage just now released blurs the entire body of Simran during the pursuit unnecessarily so that we can't tell if he shot at all. Why do you wonder then when the public doesn't want to talk with RPD? Further proof of RPD's untrustworthiness is their efforts to procure automatic license plate readers that will be used to violate privacy rights. There is no policy on the collection, storage, and sharing of the data collected on innocent people engaged in civilly protected activities, such as going to church and meetings, etc. You must vote no on introductory 371. Housing for all is one of the critical ways to reduce poverty and increase public safety. You should immediately opt in to the Emergency Tenant Protection Act, pass the Good Cause Eviction Protection Law, pass the No CFO, No Eviction Law, enact the Rochester Tenant Right to Council Law, and repeal the city's luxury housing tax break program, opt out of 485A. Thank you. 
Robert Lawton by Zoom. Robert's not in the waiting room. Meredith Mock by Zoom. Good evening, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on behalf of the Rochester chapter of the Democratic Socialist America about the proposed purchase of new equipment for the Rochester Police Department, including a license plate reader. I strongly urge the council to vote against spending $250,000 to further arm the RPD in its war against the city itself. The addition of a license plate reader to the arsenal already controlled by the RPD is especially troubling. As things stand now, there are no limits on how, when, and where this equipment will be used, let alone on whom it will be used. You must know that this equipment will be used to further terrorize our neighborhoods and crush activism, especially in the week of the brutal crowd crackdowns against protests last summer. You must understand the RPD is not going to be a good actor in this, and it is not a good idea to trust them to use equipment in a way that will best serve the city and its res residents. Furthermore, this sort of surveillance violates our due process rights and could open up the city to further lawsuits. The city cannot afford to continue to pay for the bad behavior of RPD. As the democratically elected officials of the city, it is your duty to represent the will of the people. As you very well know, this city has overwhelmingly voted to increase the oversight of the RPD and bring a balance of power back into the hands of the people. Why would you vote to give the RPD more money and equipment? Thank you for your time. Tierra Grayson by Zoom. Tierra's not in the waiting room. Matthew Gold by Zoom. Hi, uh, I'll keep this uh, brief. Uh, I, I, I want to speak about introductory seven, uh, 371. Um, I don't, I, I, I'm firmly in opposition against giving more money to the, uh, mobile, uh, mobile, uh, um, all right. That was, uh, the mobile field force, right? The mobile field force we've seen with the response to protests last year, um, that the very, the very last thing that the RPD and specifically their anti-riot units need is more money to spend on more equipment and more weapons to use against people who are um, uh, exercising their First Amendment right to uh, peacefully assemble. We also do not need to give the SWAT team more weapon, things like night, night vision go goggles and robots, which is just increasing police militarization um, and de further divorcing them from the community. Um, in regards to the license plate readers, there's no policy for how the RPD would use the data. There's no policy about data retention. There's no policy about who and who they, when, about when and where they could use them. And it's just basically giving yet more surveillance powers to the RPD. We do not need to give them more, to more power. They, they are already are basically ex exercising a veto over protests in the city and we do not need that to go further. I would, on a different note, I would like to also um, say that um, the uh, body cam footage and uh, blue light camera footage of the uh, incident involving Simran Jordan should be released um, immediately, and the body should also be released to their family. Thank you for your time. Stevie Vargas, Zoom. Hello, my name is Stevie Vargas, speaking today as a rep for the Working Families Party and the Alliance for Quality Education, but most importantly, as a constituent and resident of the city of Rochester. People in our city are hurting and city council should be investing in resources that keep our communities healthy and whole, not surveillance tools that treat working people as criminals. Voting in favor for the proposal to allow RPD license plates readers and tracking technology is to vote in favor of further destabilizing the community that has experienced significant harm at the hands of RPD, and by implementing an overreaching policy such as this one puts us further in harm's way. With implementing license plates readers and tracking, how are you to guarantee that undocumented community members who just gained the right to driver's licenses won't be targeted and their info transferred to ICE, triggering a wave of deportations? How can you guarantee that a police officer who may be abusing their partner won't use this technology to track their significant other, making it a hundred times harder for their partner to leave? How can you guarantee that officers won't use this technology to target activists and community organizers who are vocal about police accountability and exercising their right to free 
assembly. There are too many questions left unanswered and to invest in technology such as this, instead of investing in resources such as additional mental health supports and other community-based initiatives would show where this council's morals truly lie. Vote no on the predatory policy under the guise of anti-terrorism. Many of you may have seen the statement released by Working Families part Party that was signed on by multiple organizations and in support of our members. They oh, include exactly. Alliance for Quality of Education, Citizen Action of New York, Enough is Enough, Faith Community Alliance Coalition, Free the People Rock, Indivisible Rochester, NAACP, NYCLU, New York Working Families Party, Refugees Helping Refugees, Rock Citizen, Take It Down Planning Committee, Vocal New York, as well as 50 plus constituents who found out about this proposal in the 12th hour. Vote no on this proposal, invest in the community, do not allow RPD this technology. Thank you. Amelia Aquino, by Zoom. Hello, uh, my name is Amelia Aquino and I would like to talk about um, the introduction for 371, I believe that you should vote against it. There are have been a lot of good points that are brought up, so I will not repeat those, such as that RPD does not need more money for more toys for them. We know that they cannot be trusted on their own, which is why we have the police county board. Um, but I would like to make further notes that winter is coming, and I do believe that the money of $252,000 should be spent on supporting the homeless community and building them up. So instead of giving RPD that money, that we should put it back into our community, specifically North Rochester and West Rochester as well. Um, I would also like to second what Matthew said um, for the Gordon family to release the body cam footage, allow the, the Valgo family to view the body immediately and to release the blue light footage as well. Thank you. Sorry, Brendan Boner. <clears throat> Dear city council members, this email is to offer our written comment on the proposed expansion of the Rochester Police Department's mobile force unit. The Rochester chapter of the National Lawyers Guild was formed in 2017. Since then, we have routinely provided legal observers to observe police behavior at protests. After repeatedly and consistently observing the RPD's militarized response to protests in 2020, we are firmly convinced that no additional funding is needed for the RPD at all. In particular, we object to any additional funding for the mobile field force. It is clear that the RPD is already abundantly well equipped to brutalize and surveil protesters and other members of the community. Night after night throughout 2020, dozens of officers in full riot gear, backed by multiple LRAD equipped trucks and armed with pepper balls and spray flash bangs and tear gas, responded violently to peaceful protests and targeted legal observers from our chapter. None of that mobilization was cheap, and this could not have been done without RPD already having more than sufficient technology. It is not clear how funds to purchase an equipment trailer, additional license plate reader cameras, and to upgrade vehicles will do anything to increase at all to increase community safety when it's too often law enforcement that has made the community unsafe. We ask that the council refuse to rubber stamp any additional funding for the RPD, particularly when that money is earmarked for technology to increase their ability to surveil and brutalize the people of Rochester noticeably and particularly black people engaged in constitutionally protected pr protest activities. In addition to rejecting the funding in question tonight, we further ask that the future council refuse to authorize any spending on the other deadly and potentially deadly equipment such as chemical weapons and spit hoods, both of which have been used to inflict tremendous and lasting damage in the community, particularly among Okay, I'm going to go back through the A list just to make sure we don't have any of those participants in the waiting room. Robert McFarland. He's not in the waiting room. Britton Evans. She must, Britton must have left. 
Robert Lawton. He's in the waiting room. I let him in there now. Okay, thanks. Bob, you're muted, but you can begin at any time. Oh, I'm sorry. I was switching over from the uh, YouTube link. Hi, I'm uh, Bob Lawton. I'm speaking on behalf of the Rochester Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I think most of the other speakers have already outlined why uh, 371 is a bad idea, giving a quarter million dollars to RPD to spend on license plate readers. I just wanted to sort of reiterate that and add that if there's any liability that happens to this, any lawsuits against the city, which there naturally will be, since this is an area where we have no oversight determined, where the ACLU has already spoken openly against it, um, we're going to be paying for that. The city's going to be paying for that. It's not going to come out of this quarter million dollars we're giving the RPD. It's not going to come out of the RPD's budget. It's something that we're going to pay for at the end of the day. And it's something that there definitely will be litigation about, since it's such a undefined area with no oversight. I just wanted to encourage everyone to vote no on that. Thank you for your time. Tiara Grayson. It's not in the waiting room. Okay, we're gonna move on to the B list. Zanetta Green. By Zoom. Not in the waiting room. Alex White by Zoom. Mr. White, you're up. You're on mute. Alex, you're on mute. Greetings, council members. I'm Alex White, and I live in the South Wedge. I come to you today as part of the Extinction Rebellion to talk about climate change. Now, I know that all of you believe in the dangers of climate change. Is just four years ago you passed the Climate Action Plan, but since then you've done little on that on this problem. One of the many things that could make a big difference is switching your fleet of vehicles over to electric. Now, I understand that at this moment there are some vehicles with no suitable electric option, like fire trucks. But much of the fleet does have excellent electric options. Particularly, many municipalities are already starting to switch over their police cars to electric. You may remember back in June, you authorized a purchase of 30 Dodge Chargers uh, for this purpose for $1.3 million or more than $43,000 a car. Over the lifespan of these cars, they will put more than 15 tons of carbon into the air. Tesla makes a police car variant of their Model 3 starting at 36,000, which is only slightly more than the base model of the Dodge Charger, but puts zero carbon in the air. Of course, you would need to get chargers for these vehicles, and that would make them cost a little more. But even with these extra costs, Bargersville, Indiana is expecting to save $6,000 per car in the first year alone. New York City bought the more expensive Tesla Model Ys, but still expecting to save $8,000 over the operation cost of a Dodge Charger over the next five years. This will, uh, uh, there will even be more savings because electric cars cost less to repair, spend, fewer, spend more days in service, and will last longer. Tesla isn't even the only option. Volkswagen ID4, Nissan Leaf S Plus, Chevy Volt are all cheaper options being used by departments all over the world. 
The cost savings alone makes this an attractive option, is even with the Tesla Model 3, some departments are saving more than $20,000 over the life of its car. So I'm asking you to make sure that all future police car purchases are electric, is it will save the taxpayers money, help save the planet, but don't do this because I'm asking you. Do it for your children and grandchildren. They'll thank you. Inez Cairo. Good evening, City Council. My name is Ines Kiuru, and I'm a resident of downtown Rochester. I will be talking on behalf of XRA Rochester. Climate crisis is here, and the city of Rochester needs to be building sustainable infrastructure and putting to action sustainable building codes. We already have all the knowledge required in making good solutions for our futures. You have showed it, for example, by publishing a pragmatic guide in 2017 called Sustainable Practices for Building Owners and Occupants. It involves information about energy efficiency, recycling, green spaces, spaces, alternative transportation, and many more excellent aspects of green practices. Sadly, many of these examples used in the guide are taken from other cities than Rochester indicating that there are no good examples in action in our home city. Talking about stormwater management with green spaces in Philadelphia is not going to help when half of Rochester is a big concrete parking lot. Infrastructure needs to be prepared for increased rainfall, flooding and other extreme weather conditions, especially in low-income neighborhoods that should have immediate support in strengthening the in infrastructure against weather conditions. Now is the time not just to guide residents on individual level to make good choices, but for you to take action. New and restored government buildings, such as schools and offices, need to commit to zero emissions and lead the way for commercial and private properties. We need regulations to make sure we are quite literally building a sustainable future. Thank you. Tim Hartman by Zoom. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm, my name is Tim Hartman. I'm speaking on behalf of Extinction Rebellion. I'm also a city of Rochester resident. Uh, I wanna talk about planting trees or urban reforestation. Um, there's many benefits obviously to planting more and more trees. Um, they, they do capture toxins from the air. Uh, they also can uh, capture carbon, which is critical moving forward in this uh, climate catastrophe that we're already in. Uh, another benefit of, of tree planting is uh, prevention of storm runoff and uh, preventing floods. Uh, trees, uh, areas that have uh, adequate tree cover, they have much uh, cheaper air conditioning and heat bills and uh, decreased energy use. Uh, there's a physical and mental health uh, benefits to planting a massive amount of trees. 1,200 people uh, die annually from heat-related deaths. And again, those mostly come from areas without adequate tree cover. Uh, if you look at a heat index map, you see the heat emanating from areas that are the most impoverished. It's they're like a pretty strong correlation between poverty and lack of tree cover. Um, so the inequity is very pronounced in our city. I believe that we can create jobs by planting more trees in areas that are most impacted, communities that are most impacted, reduce heat-related deaths, reduce asthma, and most importantly, create jobs for those most uh, people most impacted. And reforestation is happening right now in the country, in the suburbs, but not in the city. We need more trees in the city, um, especially in impoverished areas, vacant parking lots. And I would also say that we don't need uh, more toys for the RPD, we need more trees. So thank you for listening. LeBron's Mays by Zoom. It's not in the waiting room. Alyssa Johansson by Zoom. Hi. Okay. Why don't tenants have any responsibility to maintain a clean home? Not getting upset, upset their neighbors or not damaging the property. Here's what Joyce has to say. My name is Joyce Marble Van Orsdale, and I reside at 165 Katy Street. 
I've been a resident on the street, and it's, I, I love this area because all the neighbors get along, and um, we all try to take care of each other. However, since the pandemic has started, uh, the landlords uh, have really had a very difficult time trying to control their tenants. We've had shootings, we've had fights, we've had many, many different people come into the neighborhood just destroying things. Uh, we've, we've, we've had um, other things going on also, including trash that they can't seem to get into the garbage can, um, and it's going all over the neighborhood. Um, some of us have gone out with our shovels and brooms and things and cleaned up um, and, and gotten stuff cleaned. Um, I think that it's, it's about time that these landlords be allowed to evict those tenants that cannot, will not, follow any of their directions. And we have also worked with some of the landlords um, who have given us their telephone numbers and said, okay, give us a call, let us know what's going on. It's really a shame when you get a good neighborhood that it goes down so quickly. Okay, is she done? All right. Natasha Noor. She's not in a waiting room. Okay. Christine Sibilio. Zoom. She's not in a waiting room. John Capusta. Zoom. Hi, uh, my name is John Capusta. I live in the Cobbs Hill neighborhood of Rochester. And I want to add my uh, support to much, all that we've heard about uh, the importance of working for climate justice and for just public safety policies. But I'm here tonight to urge the city council to act on behalf of the recently closed Carlson YMCA to preserve this vital community resource and to ensure the well being of all Roch Rochesterians, which is, I think, one of the most important functions that the city council plays here in our city. Since it, the Carlson Y downtown closed, it has been deeply missed. On a personal level, my family and I benefited so much from this facility. It's the place where my kids had their first swimming lessons. It's a place where when we were new to Rochester, we met other parents of young children. And it's a place where I exercised every day before work. Um, but I also saw that it was a place where uh, people from Rochester came together. Most important, supporting and acting on behalf of the Carlson Y is an issue of equity. We have seen already uh, so many resources, particularly for health and fitness, diverted away from downtown. And so I urge the city council again to integrate plans for health and fitness into its um, plans for the for economic development in the city um, and to support the health and equal access to health and fitness for all people in Rochester by acting on behalf of the Carlson YMCA. Thank you very much. Nita Brown by Zoom. It's not in the waiting room. Christina Das by Zoom. Not in the waiting room. Jacob Thorpe by Zoom. He's entering right now. Thank you.
Jacob? Yes. Okay, you're all set. Okay, but I'm waiting to be called, right? No, it's your turn. Okay, okay. Good evening, my name is Jacob and I'm speaking for the Rochester Housing Coalition. I'll be speaking about point three, which is rent control and so-called good cause eviction will increase the cost and burden to housing providers, forcing us to assume lower risk tenants, reducing housing opportunities for low income tenants. We ask you to partner with owners by offering grants and incentives to provide low income housing. And you ask for more RHA funding for housing vouchers and use existing code enforcement mechanisms to address negligence. The moratorium has been acting as a form of right to renew test that owners have been unable to evict to end a tenancy at the end of the lease, which is the key change that so-called good cause, good cause eviction will introduce. This story comes from a local owner who was too afraid to share her story herself and asked me to read it for her so she can remain anonymous. I had a single mother of two children under the age of four get physically assaulted by their, by their neighbor. They were too intimidated to file a police report after the incident, meaning I was powerless to remove their neighbor for the assault. My good tenant then ended up moving out due to the hostile in, in environment. I am unable to fill her apartment until the belligerent tenant is removed, which I am powerless to do because they pay their rent and I cannot give them a non-renewal notice due to the moratorium. This apartment sits vacant until I can figure out a way to remove the aggressive tenant from the property. As a result, I am losing $1,000 a month in rent for the vacancy. An affordable three bedroom apartment is off the market and I'm going to have to screen even harder for my units moving forward, especially if good cause eviction becomes a law. I have currently lost about $4,000 in counting since they moved out with no end in sight. Please vote no on so-called good cause eviction. Thank you for your time. Valerie McPherson. As downtown works to rebuild community and purpose, it's ironic that the Y, which is supposed to be community oriented, would lead. We need assistance to reopen or recreate this hub that has lived so well for so long. I have been a member of Carlson for almost 30 years. Like others, I was shocked to receive a letter saying that my Y had closed not even a letter warning this might happen, just a dead on letter offering no options, not asking for input. Carlson has been the most diverse and supportive why. For all, Carlson is one city bus ride from home, the only why that offers that advantage. One member said, when we work out, no one knows if you're a custodian or a CEO because Carlson removed walls that often exist between people. We were companions, supporters, advocates for each other. It's a shame that the decision makers have so little sense of what they have taken away. As our city council, how will you help fill the loss of our downtown location? Valerie McPherson. Mary DeLisandro. To members of city council, I'm Mary DeAlessandro an investor of 40 plus years. I'm selling everything. I moved out of the city nine months ago. My family who owned well over 100 units has sold everything and also moved out of the city. Rochester leadership does not allow the city to have nice things. City of Rochester's leadership has failed the neighborhoods, investors and community as a whole. Neighborhoods are unstable and unsafe with drug dealing, gunshots, stabbings and carjacks. People are afraid to go outside. How did you let this happen? Who commits the crime? Homeowners, tenants, people coming from the suburbs. Our city leadership panders to and sucks up to tenants for votes and to look like they care. Winners are more important than the homeowners. The city does not hold tenants accountable for anything. You are not concerned about tenants that won't pay rent and can't pay rent that apartments are destroyed over and over, or better said, anything that takes away the quality of life in the, the city has neighborhood associations, PAC PAC, the mayor's leadership university to help homeowners to make their neighborhoods a better place to live. But you were unwilling to hold those accountable that were causing the problems in the neighborhoods. The people who worked so hard to have a nice neighborhood 
were given empty promises for years and years. Now we have bigger problems using the same tactics, same leadership. I tried to get the old time neighborhood activists to come back and give it another try. Here is what they said. After 20 years, same problems, just new faces. That tells me you failed. But our city leadership has regulated and legislated housing, housing providers to the point that those regulations and codes have added to the destruction of neighborhoods and the lack of affordable housing. Every code and legislation has a cost value to, the, to, to it, the tenant and the homeowner. How will rent control affect the tenants and homeowners? Lower rent means less maintenance. Lower rent means less quality, affordable housing. Deteriorating neighborhoods. That's time. Kathleen Prince on Zoom. Kathleen, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Thank you. I would like to address city council regarding ATVs and dirt bikes speeding up and down Boxart Street, as well as in the trails in Turning Point Park. Uh, motorized vehicles aren't even allowed in Turning Point Park past the parking lot. But every day I'm down there, which is at least five times a week, I am forced off the trail with my dog by either dirt bikes or ATVs. Just yesterday, within five minutes of each other, there was a dirt bike, then came through an ATV with a three-year-old and what appeared to be the grandfather on it, no helmets. I'm forced off the trail with my dog. I watch this every day. They're scaring the daylights out of these dogs. They're destroying quality of life. People come into that park from all areas of the country and it's really not a good look for the city. Uh, this is lawlessness. It might seem minor, but it really is a slippery slope. They go down Boxart Street at 1130 at night, up and down for two hours. What could they possibly be doing in the park? It's dark. There's nothing good going on down there when it's dark. I'm not sure who's responsible for this. And I know that RPD is very busy. Maybe they can't get here. Maybe somebody can call the sheriff or the state police in. I really don't know. But it has been going on for at least a year. And it also happens in the winter, but then they flip over to snowmobiles. So I would like to see something done about this, not just for myself, but for my neighbors and everyone else. Thank you very much for your time and God bless the RPD. Terry Cicino. Cicini. My name is Terry and I would like you to pass good cause. Some new landlords from Florida bought my building and then my rent went up by weight by over 40%. I was told it was only going to go up $25, but it keeps going up higher. Now he doesn't want to renew my lease because he says he could get more money from a new tenant. I've lived here 12 years and I'm on disability and I have a fixed income. I don't know where to go. I'm a good tenant. I always pay my rent on time and I keep things up but it seems like that just doesn't matter to anybody. I'm trying to reach an agreement and he might let me stay for eight more months, but I'll still have to pay $150 more for the next few months and then I'll still have to leave. I want the city to pass the good cause policy that will protect tenants like me from evictions and non-renewal of leases for no good reason. Is Kriana Dunaway in the waiting room? Kriana's on. Kriana? Yes. It's your turn. Good evening, Council. I am here to speak about the good cause protection law. I was going to give you a little detail on me. I am Kiana Dunaway, a resident of Rochester, New York, that is currently uh, facing eviction. My eviction process is being because of being uh, withholding 
rent from my landlord. My property is very damaged. I've been staying at my home for five years. I've been asking my landlord for over a year to fix the damages on my property. Instead, he decided to take me to court for eviction with the good, good, the good cause protection that will help. It would help a lot of tenants of Rochester, New York, to, for they would not have to face retaliation from our landlords. It will also stop the rent increase. I mean, looking for another property right now, the rent is sixteen to eighteen hundred um, dollars of, of for rent. We are also trying to be able to let the tenants be able to renew their leases if they was wanting to do that. I have water damage in my property. I have holes in my walls that's not caused by me. We have mice and roaches running around the property. The, the, the landlord is not trying to send land uh, maintenance over there. I have called the city and we have a lot of inspections done. We have a lot of violations or not only on my my home, but on all of the units that my landlord, Tall Levely, owns right now, we need this good cost protection to be put into place right now. We needed the good cost prote eviction protections to be put in place four years ago, uh, City Council. I need you to listen to to what we are what we are going through right here in the city of Rochester with people being eviction. This put this will protect a lot of people from being put out on the streets. Not only to be helping them with not being put out on the street, we need protection from our landlords as well. Um, we need people to know that our landlords are not going to be able to put us out just because they don't want to fix anything that's, that's in our time. property. Thank you. Okay, Madam President. It is 7.32. Yes, we've, we've run out of time for this session, but for anyone who's left on the list, didn't get a chance to speak, they're welcome to... Uh, speak after the full council meets, that's an option, or they can come to next month's council meeting and we'll put them at the top of the list. So we're going to break momentarily and prepare for our full council meeting. Thank you. 